Philosophy 15. I'm Scott Aiken. And I'm Robert Briggs. We are two philosophy professors. Uh, these are unscripted conversations, 15 minutes at a clip. We're the authors of Political Argument in a Polarized Age, the Polity and Why We Argue and How We Should from Rutledge. We're going to start a, a series of the, what is it, what's the, the trouble, trouble with. The trouble with. Yeah. Um, and uh, Rob, we're going to start off this is a, this initial version of the trouble with because it's an auspicious date. Right, it's Hegel's two hundred and fifty first birthday, so we would thought we thought we might have a slightly more unscripted than usual discussion. Uh, Philosophizing without a net <laughs> about the trouble with Hegel. The trouble with Hegel. So maybe the way that maybe to sort of pause and say the way that we'll try to do this is we'll say look here's the insight behind the program right and then but in some ways the insight in sort of tragic fashion the insight almost is hegelian fashion. almost hegelian let us let's let's not get ahead of ourselves <laughs> uh in almost hegelian we'll just say in tragic fashion to at the very least maybe not put our thumbs on the on the scales too much uh, that the inside is in some ways a source of the trouble. So let's start with the inside of uh, with Hegel's insight. Um, I guess I, it, one one sort of bigger thought. It's a kind of Aristotelian idea, right? Okay. That as hard as it is to get the truth, it's even harder to miss it entirely. It's right. So, <laughs> and so, so everybody's so got everyone's something right. It's kind of like an unskilled boxer, as he yeah. says of the the pre Socratics. It's like right. a, so okay. So, so Hegel surely get, I mean, he wrote so much, it would be um, absolutely unbelievable if it was all false, right? Okay, right. So something's got to be right. Well, th it seems like there's a big insight driving the Hegelian <laughs> that's right. system. The big insight uh, can sometimes just be captured as dialectics. Um, what exactly that is is, in fact, maybe a little bit more controversial. But, uh, but the basic thought seems to be that um, – that one of the best ways to, in some ways, do philosophy and then sort of integrate or be able to look at disagreements is look at ways that these views talk past each other and find ways of synthesizing them uh, and so that you capture the insights behind all of these, these views uh, and look for ones that are able to be able to um, – resolve the disagreement and be able to capture and preserve the insights that drove what was the initial disagreement. And so the crucial thing about Hegelian dialectics is that you might say all, many of these debates are debates where folks are talking past each other because of either certain kinds of historical problems or maybe just the ways that the concepts have developed. Once we then put things in a kind of an historical context, we see ways that the, the, the concepts can be uh, – massaged so that we can uh, reduce the conflict. So we might say Hegelian dialectics or the Hegelian logic is one of the ways to be able to resolve it. And that's supposed to solve a lot of problems. It solves skeptical problems. It solves certain kinds of political problems about the ways that we identify each other. It solves problems in terms of the, uh, the question of who we are and what reflective rational animals should be doing. Uh, it looks like it's sort of, it has a lot of promise because it's, in some ways, a view about debates, <laughs> right? Uh, so it's a kind of an approach to debates. Uh, it's not a, in some ways, it's not a substantive view. It's a view about views. Um, so let me, I don't know if my, under, my conception of the, 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 the nugget of truth in Hegel is different from what you just articulated or the same thing, which might be the trouble with Hegel. It might be the first trouble with Hegel, okay, <laughs> right? So, the so here's one understandability way, you know, somebody like sort of, you know, I'll give you $500 to say what you think the right thing, you know, wh what's right in Hegel. I'd articulate it like this, and, and by the way, not, well, I won't speak for Scott, I'm not a Hegel scholar. Um, so let me put it this way. Let me ask a question. I take it that the one way of articulating the core insight of Hegel is that the that the primary way of coming to know is coming to realize, right? That is the primary way of coming 
to know something is coming to see it as the thing that was always there that in a way you always knew you or always, in a way you always you, saw it orthogonally yeah right right right, right, right. Yeah. That, that it's a coming to see what was already there right. it's not adding something it's not taking something new on so much as it's a coming to realize or conceptualize what's already evident in a way that makes it both seem new but newly discovered right new n- not new not not newly manifest well not and a product of that reasoning of realization right, right. that's that's the other part of the hegelian program is that it's the application of that situated reason that's supposed to in some ways not just make it accessible as real, but also make it real qua real, right? Like, yeah. that's what makes it real for you. The real is the rational, and the rational is the real. seems to be the he- Hegelism yeah. that, um, that in some ways, the sort of the recognized status of something as is is, in some, in some ways, the product of reason. So and nothing that is new right, is the – is maybe we're getting into what – that strikes me as the beginning of the trouble. Like, nothing is new. There's only new descriptions or new cognizings yeah. of things. Right. So now we're getting to the trouble with. Good. Because we got from the insight, which is in some ways a kind of rationalism. Right? In some ways, Hegel's program is a kind of rationalism. But the rationalism yields a kind of idealism. Right. Because it's ultimately the, the stuff. Of philosophy and everything and else. everything else, natural science, religion, everything else is conceptual. Yes, material, right? To the point where it's not even clear on the basis of what a distinction between conceptual and non-conceptual material could possibly be drawn. That's exactly right. It. So once it's all conceptual, by the way, you're. Ro- Oddly, Rorty and other Rorty. pragmatists have a way of sort of utilizing this. And Barclay does yeah, the same yeah, thing. It's yeah. like it's Barclay's master argument. Yeah. Looks like it's the same version as the same thing. Tell me, yeah. tell me what's, tell me what the counterexample yeah, is, and right. everything's everything's mental or yeah, everything's conceptual. Yeah, that's right. Once <laughs> everything is conceptual or a matter of conceptualization, there's nothing. Give me a There's no point. There's no point even to. See, I mean, yeah. this is really this is the trouble, right? Because once you think the 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 good thought, which is that, well, wait a minute. Let's make it as let's make it as good as we can. Make it as good as we can, and as intuitive as we certain as we can. Well, wait a minute. There is a kind of knowledge that really is a coming to see as something that initially looked unfamiliar, but coming to see it as the thing that's always been there. Right? Yeah. Like that and, is that's a deep and that's that's kind of and again that's what makes it a rationalist program. Like that's the reason why Plato called it a myth of recollection. That's I right. mean, it's it's in some ways something that you were always already in contact with. That's right. And that in some ways the thinking it through exfoliated the the unexpressed and made explicit that it, it innate inchoate familiarity with the thing that you had to have already kind of known already. That's right, and so, it's a model of understanding. And it's a great kind of, model of understanding. Yeah, because that's what understanding seems. It seems like that's what understanding is. Now you can explain. Now you can argue. Now you can integrate it into into practical life. Now it can be a thing that you can then teach others. The you might call it the dialecticality of it all is in fact the insight, right? And it's a deep and important insight. So yes, that's that's the that's what Hegel got. Boom. It's the first 25 pages or so of the phenomenology. The phenomenology. Unfortunately, yes. there's another couple hundred pages of that book. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Where you see the trouble, right? So it, this is the thought. This is the hammer of a thought that turns everything into a nail, right? And, and then you have to say, well, then what's not a nail? Right? It was like... I. Tell, well, tell me something that tell me something that this that the dialectic doesn't work on. Now here's the problem: the hammer's not a nail. The hammer, <laughs> <laughs> right? That's the problem. Uh, it's yes, a, it's a hammer that turns everything into a nail, and then you say, "Well, wait a minute, what's the thing what's in the my hammer?" hammer? <laughs> right? But this is in some ways. So Hegelians have an answer to a version of this, right? Because they I, always have an answer. I, it's, and, and by it's the way, it's, it's always the same answer. answer. Well, it's, it's always the same answer. Because, what's the, because they would say, well, this is, this is the kind of question that reflective beings ask, right? And so they say, look, whenever you did that, 
right? That's not the phenomenological perspective. That's the phenomenologist's perspective. That's the, that's you thinking about the thinking. And so what what we did, what we just did then was we said, what do we do? We dialecticalized your question. Yeah. That's you. That's now saying, what's the intelligibility, the rational intelligibility of that thing? And they say, we've got an answer to that. That's and right. by the way, we can play that. If you want to keep going meta, we can. We 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 know how to do that game. Yeah, but this is a bug versus a this is a feature versus a, versus a bug debate. Okay. Because that sounds to me like, well, wait a minute. So now there's a distinction between the phenomenology and the perspective of the phenomenologist, yes. the person who's theorizing. The that's phenomenon. right. But because wait a that's, minute. That, that sounds like more stuff that's not nails. <laughs> You've just what? added, and then and then they say, oh, okay, we but can do it. But that's a backward. That's backward. So again, I think that every Hegelian is going to say, but that's you looking backwards at it, right? That's you looking backwards at it and saying, because the, the the answer isn't that it's the 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 items; it's the process of looking at the items and making them intelligible. Uh, right? Is the hammer not a nail? Okay, so uh, maybe we're hung up on that metaphor, but yeah, uh, I, but it is it is something about the uh, uh, there is something about this, and even. So we think of like sort of classic responses to Hegel, right? Where it's like folks say, like Kierkegaard famously said, the answer to Hegel is not yes, but. The answer to Hegel is no explanation for. And so the question then is, well, how, what exactly is the no explanation for? Like what exactly does that look like? Um, and the problem is that at least the problem with that is that it looks like it has to deny something deep about the Hegelian insight, not just, you might say, the Hegelian overreach, but something about the insight, which is namely that reason is the criterion for the real. Right. Um, and so, again, the Kierkegaardian response is, well, that's, that's absurdity, bro, <laughs> right? But, that, but in some ways, that's, that's a, there's a kind of realist response to a lot of these programs where they say, like, look, you know, give me a counterexample to the claim that all things are, you might say, manifestations of concepts. And then you'd say, well, I can't because it looks like we got a problem. They'd say, yeah, yeah that counts in my favor. And, yeah. your an and, and the pushback is, no exclamation yeah. point. <laughs> it's a Barclayan, right? That's a challenge to the part. That's yeah. a challenge to idea. But let me that's just the problem, the challenge of idealism uberhaus. That's right. So let me push one once more on the hammer and nail okay. <laughs> uh, way of construing the trouble with Hegel. My, my big conception, my big concern about the Hegelian program were it true, there would be no position from which to cognize it being true. So again, I think maybe now one they have a story about how history works yeah, yeah, and yeah. the development of consciousness and all that. But I, You're, yeah, yeah, I think that the answer is like, look, absolute knowing or whatever's at the end of this dialectic is a kind of a, a kind of a vanishing point uh, of that. We're, but we're lucky for us. We're a little bit further along. Like we're on the other side of the Greeks. We're on the other side of the the Renaissance and the Reformation. We're on the other side of the modern the modern movement. And so we've got a little bit of clarity to be able to say all of this, right? Like yeah. Aristotle would be able to say the same thing. It's like, hey, lucky for you, got to read some Aristotle, and lucky for me, I got to read the Pre-Socratics. Well, I wouldn't be able to be Aristotle if it weren't for those other folks. Right. So and so the answer is that look, it's 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 the unfolding of history that 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 does this. We've been able to make an abduction of. I mean, that's maybe the right way. We've been able to, you might say, give the history of this and then from the phenomenologist perspective be able to make an inference about it. Right, and that's the flip side of the, 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 the commitment to the nothing, to the, that there's nothing new. Right. It's that history is the story of some kind of widening of understanding, you know, development of, realiza of the realization of consciousness, the improvement of our concepts, and so there's a, um, a kind of optimism about the arc of the the world story that also strikes me as a trouble with Hegel. Why yeah, there might be there might be more absurd think? there might just be more absurd stuff. <laughs> I think we might be able to end there. There might be just more absurd stuff. Philosophy 15, folks, making making things worse 15 minutes at a time. <laughs>